Hello, everyone, and welcome to Autism Stories, where we connect you with the amazing people that help autistic teens and adults become more independent and successful. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Who are the true experts about the autistic experience and how can they help change the world? In this episode, we have a discussion about this very important topic with Jillian Nelson, the community resource and policy advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Jillian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. It's a pleasure to always get to talk autism with people that care about it. Just starting off, where does your story in the autism community start? Um, that's a really tough question, Doug. Um, I have a really, really rich history of autism. Um, when I was a child, my cousin was diagnosed with autism. Um, and he is, well, he was um, more profoundly impacted with a lot higher support needs. And he was nonverbal, required 24 hour supervision. So autism has always been a part of our family. Um, but it wasn't until about 2003, when my little brother was diagnosed, um, that my own personal journey as an autistic person started. Um, growing up, I'd always been um, labeled as everything but autism, um, which is really common for girls of my generation. Um, the ADHD, was the borderline personality disorder, it was depression, it was anxiety, it was everything but autism. And then when they saw my brother, who was in preschool, he's a lot younger than me, it really kind of triggered that idea that, hey, maybe this is what was going on all along, and I got assessed as an adult since 21, and sure enough, I, it turns out I didn't have all those other labels, and I was just autistic. You were still the same person, but how did the knowledge that you were autistic change your life after receiving the diagnosis? Oh, God, it, it changed everything. Um, before I received my diagnosis, um, I was actually a homeless drug addict. I couldn't get anything out I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't maintain friendships and relationships. I was doing a lot of really negative things just to kind of fit in where I could. Having a diagnosis put everything into perspective, and then it really gave me the tools to kind of figure out how to navigate this world. And... Instead of sitting there wondering why I was struggling with the things I was struggling with, I knew, so I could accommodate myself, or I could ask for accommodations, or I could explain um, some of my quirky behavior to people so that they could better understand. And I kind of, I always tell people when they call my work that it doesn't, getting a diagnosis of autism doesn't change anything, it just explains everything. And, I mean, it's like a car. You, if your car is making a funny noise and it's not running well, you're not just going to sit there and swap out any part of manual and hope for the best. It's going to go a lot better fixing your car once you know it's not working right and you know what you need to focus on. In uh, doing research for this interview, I learned that in 2006 you signed up for the Partners in Policy policy making, which is a self-advocacy program. In in reading about this, it sounds like this was a life-changing experience for you. What did you learn from the Partners in Policy Making program? God, uh, you asked me so many big questions. <laughs> uh, I learned everything. Uh, I think the most important takeaway I got from that, um, it was where I learned how to accept myself. Uh, so funny story. I didn't want to sign up for partners in policy making. Um, my mom had completed it the year before and I was in college and I wanted to live at home and go to school and not pay rent and my mom said I could do that if I signed up for partners in policy making. In 2006, I didn't tell anyone I was autistic. It was like my dirty little secret. We didn't talk about it. We didn't discuss it. Like if I had to disclose to someone, it was, it was a big deal and I had to really trust them and really know them. Um, but going to partners in policy making, like if I applied and I thought there's no way that I'm going to get it. Like they're going to get thousands of applications. Why would they pick me? And then they picked me. <laughs> and I was like, man, I'm not going to do this thing. But I also really wanted free ride. <laughs> so I went along with it. And the very, very first weekend, being in a room full of people, 
that didn't see me having a disability as something that made me weak or mm-hmm. something that made me an outsider. And having that acceptance, it, it was the first step for me accepting myself and me becoming a strong, proud self-advocate. And I learned everything else. I learned all about housing and employment and education and how to change the world at a county level and how to change the world at a state level and how to change the world the world at a federal level. But I think the most important thing I took from that was that it was okay to be proud of who I was and the value of relationships and working as a team and finding your allies and having an incredible network to help you make change possible. Fast forward to 2019, and you are currently the uh, community and resource and policy advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. So you're the first person that people talk to uh, when they're diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, when they contact the Autism Society of Minnesota. What's the message you share with people when they talk to you? The number one thing I want to tell people when they first call me it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Everything's going to be fine, whether you're an adult getting a diagnosis or whether you're a parent or a kid that was just diagnosed. But nothing's changing. You just have a whole lot more tools now to know how to make things work. And then more importantly than those tools, you have a whole community around you now. And you have people that have been where you are, the people that have faced the same challenges that you're facing. And those people are always willing to help and make sure that everything works because it's not the end of the world. It's just a different world. So I'd imagine talking on the phone and connecting with people in person is a pretty important part of your job. So I know for many autistic people, these social pieces of work can be challenging. So I think you're a great person to ask this. What suggestions do you have in making this these type of activities less stressful? Um, number one, I really, really recommend finding employment in a field that you're really passionate about. Um, basically, when I get to talk to people about autism and I have to make those social connections, it's a lot easier because I'm info dumping on them about my special interests. Um, we all know that autistic people can talk for hours about their special interest, right? Um, I just got lucky and I found a job that happened to tie in my special interest. A lot of it, though, too, comes down to scripting. And I know in a lot of ways we consider scripting and masking that they can have a negative impact. But it also can have a positive impact in some ways. Like if I know... If I've taken the time to figure out what in my job I'm going to need to say over and over and over, after hearing myself say it over and over and over, a certain script develops. So while I I am giving each person who calls a very individualized experience, there's also things in there that become very routine, like my welcome to the autism community, this isn't the end of the world talk, or they talk about self-acceptance and how that's important. So it's developing a lot of scripts over time where once you've identified the things you're going to say over and over and over, you can find your comfort within those things and not have to be as concerned about, I have to answer this, this is something scary because I have to answer a question. And just realizing that a lot of our interactions, especially in the workplace, tend to be very routine and repetitive. In addition to talking on the phone and and some of the general social pieces of your job, what are the responsibilities for you as the community resource and policy advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota? Um, Well, here's the Autism Society of Minnesota, or AWESOME, as we commonly go by. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody in this office wears a single hat. So, um, as a community resource and policy advocate, I manage all of our incoming information resource requests. Um, so, it's answering a lot of questions like, well, where do I find resources? What do I do? I was just diagnosed. Um, but also, the answering a lot of unique questions like, how do I find a product that will keep my six-year-old from breaking our TV every week? Or, 
what's the best job breed for a kid with autism? <laughs> or what places does employment work? Um, one of the most challenging questions I've answered this year is whether or not it's legal for your employer to ban you from disclosing at work. Mm-hmm. So once I get questions, if I don't immediately know the answer, I do a lot of research and a lot of digging, which also kind of informs the second main function of my job, which is I'm the policy advocate. So I direct all of our public policy work, um, both federally and at a state level. Um, so I make recommendations for legislation that should be introduced in the best interest of the autism community, or also showing the capital if there's legislation being introduced somewhere else that is not in the best interest of the autism community um, to kind of fight against that. Um, I also work with our advocacy committee to kind of give individuals with autism as well as family members um, the power and skills to make sure that they're healthy with the lobbying efforts and that their voices are being heard on the political scene. And I also curate our bookstore. So we have a retail collection that goes to some of our large events or community events where people can come in and shop in my office at any time. Um, and it's a collection of books and fidgets and sensory tools that have all been curated by an autistic adult um, to provide education and just things to make life a little bit easier. And then I also do um, a lot of our research fairs where we go to the community and represent the Autism Society and help people get connected with who we are so that they connect with those services. There's just a couple things. I'm not busy. (laughs) It sounds like the exact opposite. Uh, (laughs) But it's it's easy because I love what I do. So it's it's long hours um, and sometimes it's very stressful. But there's always those rewarding moments when you realize what an impact you're making in this community that's also my own community. And that makes those long hours go fly by a lot faster. Hmm. Which, what is the uh, your mo- your favorite fidget toy that you have in the office? Oh, God, it changes all the time. And I think if I had to pick right now, um, it's a toss-up between the Simple Dimple by Fat Brain. Um, it's like a little silicone eight. It looks like an eight. And it's hard plastic and it's got these like silicone bubbles in the middle of the eight that you can like pop back and forth. Uh-huh. Or we have a vibrating seat cushion. Like it's pressure activated. So like you hug it or you lean on it and it vibrates. And it's completely silent, but it's just really, really great input. It makes me happy. So one's more like a little more intrusive and the other one's something that I can keep in my pocket and take with me everywhere. And actually one of my favorite parts about the bookstore is I also get to test out all the new possible fidgets. So if I see something, I can call the manufacturer and be like, hey, I think that might be cool. Can you send me a sample? And then I get to play with all the new things and decide if it's great or if it's horrible. Who doesn't love a free sample? (laughs) In fact, I do. I do also share with the other autistic people in my office. Sometimes they love what I hate and vice versa. It seems that through your work, you're quite often educating the community in in regards to the experiences of autistic people. I think we've come a a long way in terms of education, but we still have a long way to go with this. So what what do you think neurotypical people still need to learn about the experiences of autistic people? I think the biggest two I need them to learn is that our voices are really, really important, especially parents, providers, and educators. Autistic adults used to be autistic kids, and we went through some stuff to get to where we are. Um, We found our voices, or whatever we, we communicate. But if we're talking to you about our experience as an autistic adult, or as an autistic child from our past, what we're saying to you matters. And stepping back and listening is the most valuable tool we have to help the tiny autistic people that are grown up still. Um, and then I, I would really like neurotypicals to also frame that in the concept of understanding that number one, Sometimes the social interactions where we're trying to communicate what we know about life as an autistic person 
they may not always go exactly the way that a neurotypical thing they should. And part of that is the diagnosis of social impairment is like a hallmark trait for someone with autism. Um, and I think that gets lost in that place when autistic people try to take on a voice of leadership or on a voice of authority that it's assumed that because we can step into that place of leadership and authority, we should also magically have the social skills of what the neurotypical world considers a leader. Um, I would also like neurotypicals to recognize that when we are talking about those tasks and saying, this is harmful, this hurt me, to remember that there is a lot of emotion there Mm -hmm. because many of us are speaking from a place of significant trauma. And the, the, the world isn't looking significantly enough yet at the trauma that autistic people experience existing in a world that's not made for us. So approaching those conversations, especially those tough conversations with, with kindness and remembering that for us to step forward and say, this is hard or this is bad or this is hurtful or this is, this is stressful or this is not okay, if we're still a social impairment and potential trauma, that takes a lot. And, and rather than looking at the errors in the message or the errors in the socialization, please recognize the bravery and the tenacity that it takes for us to step forward to communicate those messages because we want a better world. Does that make sense? Yes, that, that's, that's a great message. I'm really passionate about supporting all people with autism and so often autistic people that are part of the LGBT community don't get the support they need. So that's why uh, in doing research it was great to see that you offered a sensory sensitive space at the Minnesota Pride this past June on behalf of the Autism Society of Minnesota and that you facilitate an ongoing support group for the LGBT and autism community. Can you explain to our listeners why a space like this at Pride is so important? And what was the feedback that you got from those that visited the space? These two things, um, the escape space at Pride and the LGBT support group, these two things, these are my projects of my heart. Uh, I love them so much. Um, being an autistic lesbian, I really, and working in the field, I started to realize that a lot more of the people that I work with were identified as LGBT. So I, did, I started doing a lot of research, and there, there's not a lot of data out yet about the LGB portion of the community, but the current stats are saying that individuals with autism are seven times more likely to identify as gender non-conforming or transgender than our neurotypical counterparts. And as I started to see this trend, I realized there are so many pieces of the LGBT community and the LGBTQ experience and the LGBTQ culture that are so separate from the heteronormative culture. And then trying to navigate those things as a person with a disability that causes social impairment is a really big challenge. (laughs) Um, So we realized that we needed to have the LGBT support group, and that's the part that actually came first. Because we wanted to have a place where individuals in this community, in the LGBT community, felt comfortable talking about the social interactions that they weren't sure how to navigate with other people that were having the same social interactions as part of the same community. The sensory friendly space came shortly after that and it was kind of it came out of a conversation from our support group where we were talking about who was going to pride and almost nobody in the room was going to go to pride and it was because pride was inaccessible it's allowed and it's hot and it's crowded um to put this in perspective here in minnesota we have one of the largest pride festivals and they estimated in uh in the two-day festival, Saturday and Sunday, approximately 400,000 people will enter that park. And that park is about four city blocks. <laughs> so there's a lot of people in a very little space. Um, and as you can imagine, there's drink shows, and there's vendors, and there's food. It's, it's a sensory nightmare. Um, so the Twin Cities Pride Organization was doing a listening session. And I went, and my main message was, they, they were looking to figure out how to include marginalized communities and 
pride. And my message was, we're not included because we can't even enter the park. So my goal when I walked in there was they'd give me a small tent, like one of the vendor booths, and I would figure out some way to make that teeny tiny vendor booth somehow sensory friendly so that people had a place to escape to if they just needed a couple of minutes. I had no idea how I was going to do it. And lo and behold, they gave me a 20 by 20 square foot tent in the center of the park. Um, they removed vendors. Um, we have approximately 20 feet in any direction where there's nobody next to us so that it's a calmer space. And they air conditioned it. Um, the first year we had it, we were expecting to get maybe 30, 40 people. Um, the tent was never empty. Um, mm. This was our third summer. And it just keeps growing. Um, the people come, and the, the first four hours of the first day are my favorite. Because it's people running up. They're like, okay, I want to figure out where you were, so that when I need you later, you're here. And the young people running up and being like, I'm transgender and autistic. And I look at them and I'm like, well, I'm autistic and lesbian. And just seeing the power of what that intersectionality of acceptance means to them. The, we, we have LGBT-friendly spaces in our community. We have autistic-friendly spaces in our community. But there's very little in the way of autistic, LGBT-friendly spaces. So to have that place where you are 100% accepted, where you are 100% understood, is just an amazing validation for the community. And it, it keeps growing, and more and more people keep coming every year. Um, it, it's... The feedback has been nothing but amazing. And we're so thankful you're here. It makes such a difference. And it's uniting the community in ways we never thought possible. It's not just the autistic community that's coming. It's people with anxiety. It's people with mental health challenges. It's people with chronic illness. It's, it's just creating this vibrant space for LGBT disability culture to flourish. And it is the most beautiful, mind-blowing thing to watch. What's been the response from Minnesota Pride after kind of seeing the interest in the sensory space? So the very first year, um, we walked through it together, and we cried as a group. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the executive director and the board president walked through it with me, and we watched the people embracing it, and we cried. And they promised me it will always be there um, as the years go on. Um, <laughs> we run into some of the challenges that go on with playing together at any large festival. Um, like this year, we were missing our air conditioner when we got there to set up at all of the walls of our car. And in the beginning, like, I was getting a lot of pushback from like their tent set of people. They're like, oh, well, you're, you're on the list, but you're just going to have to wait. And I called the executive director. I'm like, hey, this is what's happening. And they recognize the need of, of this space for the community. But the executive director, as soon as she heard that our tent wasn't ready, that, and that they were brushing us off, she got right on the phone and she's like, no, like, the people that were making all this stuff set up, obviously, this needs to be a priority. This is one of the most important things we offer. We need to get this done now, put them at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. So they're recognizing the need. And... They're really excited to continue to have it. And as it goes on, they start to reach out to us about other things. Like their concert this year, um, it's the first time that we've really sat down and talked about how to make the big Pride Festival concert that happens Saturday night a more inclusive or other events that they have throughout the year. Um, we'll have conversations about simple things they can do to make it more inclusive. Um, so it's really kind of opened up their eyes to the diversity of needs within the LGBT community and the awareness and also understanding that the things that are great for the autism community, but it's, it's a universal design approach. Nothing right. that you put in place to help people with autism is going to hurt other people. It's only going to make it a better experience for everyone. Mm. Um, so we've been really communicate, communicative and just absolutely fabulous to work with. So what's next? for you and what would you tell other autistic people that want to change the world like you do? Um, well, what's next for me is I'm going to keep changing the world over here. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping to 
I, I love getting to do what I do now, and I do hate people about autism, but I'd really like to take that to a larger level. Um, outside of my job, I'm working on launching a YouTube channel, and um, I have a presence on Facebook as, as a motivational speaker. Um, my YouTube channel is going to be Autism in Wonderland. Um, and I really hope to keep kind of sending, sending the message of autism acceptance and autism understanding and community bridge building, because that's, that's really where my passion lies. It's how, how do we build bridges to make change rather than just fight with one another? And the same, that would be my message for any autistic person that wants to change the world. Find a place where we need to build bridge and find the vested stakeholders that also need that bridge and work together to find that common ground and to figure out how to change um, our stories matter, of our experiences matter, more than you even know. Um, so I I was able to get legislation shut down within 36 hours. It was going to do a lot of harm to special education just by telling my story. And I think in our community, a lot of times, we hold that card really close. Um, but when we tell our stories and we own our truth about being autistic adults, we're changing the perception of autism for the whole world. And within that perception, we're changing the idea of presumed incompetence. When we tell our stories, when we speak openly about who we are, we're showing the world what we're capable of. And when they realize what people with autism are capable of, we're going to have a lot more opportunities and we're going to change the world. And we all have our own to change in the world, whether it's through a podcast or through our job or through legislative activity or just by changing stigma, by changing the perception. It's all those little pieces together that are going to make a bigger impact. Hmm. Run this together. I mean, there's that saying that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. But it's going to take a lot of people with autism to change the world and change how we're seeing it, saying, change how we're treated. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me either on Facebook or through the Autism Society of Manessa.media to help people. Um, we're never trying to weigh information resource call based on geographic reasons. So I'm happy to help anyone that's hearing this and give them information on how to connect with the right resources. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and thank you to Jillian for the conversation. There really were so many insightful things that Jillian shared with us, but something I think that is really important that she discussed is when she talked about when autistic people are coming to you and talking to you about past experiences that were traumatic, to really approach these conversations with the utmost amount of kindness, because this really takes so much, and to focus really on the bravery of the message, then so much on if there were any errors in the message due to communication or social communication. Did you know so often Autistic teens and adults struggle with anxiety and, as a result, don't have success in their lives. Autism Personal Coach is a unique service in that we help our clients by working on meaningful, individualized goals at the home and in the community, so anxiety is greatly reduced, and as a result, um, people that we work with can become much more independent and successful. To get an autism coach for a loved one or yourself to achieve your goals or dreams, it's very easy. All you have to do is email autismpersonalcoach at yahoo.com or call 216-336-5889 and request a coach today. On the next episode of Autism Stories, we will talk with Mark Frummerlid about self-employment for autistic people. Talk to you then. Learn it all.
Are different. 